Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Jeremiah, and I am turning in my Bible to Jeremiah chapter 9. And we left off in verse 2 last time. So we'll just backtrack a couple of verses and start our reading in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1. So grab your Bible if you can, so you can follow along with me, and we'll study it verse by verse. And speaking of that, you can study the whole Bible at the Scripture Verse by Verse website using my audio Bible commentaries. Study it from Genesis through Revelation, not just once, but twice, and that's found at the Bible versebyverse.com Well, today, as I said, we're in Jeremiah chapter 9, and we begin in verse 1. So let's pray. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah, he had a tough time. He, as I mentioned before, I think... He's, I think he's my favorite Old Testament prophet. In fact, whenever I think of that, I always think of Jeremiah, so he must be. It's because he didn't, he didn't water down the Word of God. At a time when the land was filled with false preachers and teachers telling terrible sinners and lukewarm believers at best what they wanted to hear, Jeremiah stood out and he proclaimed the truth even though it made him very unpopular unpopular with people but popular with God and really that's the only thing that matters but he preached his heart out and people didn't listen he warned and he warned from the word of God and he said trouble's coming And they wouldn't listen. And so trouble is coming. And we pick it up with Jeremiah saying in chapter 9, verse 1, Oh, that my head were waters, and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Jeremiah can't cry anymore, he's saying. I just can't. I'm, I'm out of tears. So here's here's a good preacher. He not only was faithful to the Word of God, which was first and foremost, but he cared about the people. Even though they were sinful and they were rebellious, he didn't want them to be punished. That's why he preached the Word. He had the heart of God because God didn't want that to happen either. And then he says in verse 2, Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place for wayfaring men that I might leave my people and go from them for they are all adulterers an assembly of treacherous men he just wanted to get away from it all I mean he did his job you know he hung in there he preached the word even when it wasn't fun and now he saw that no one was repenting and he just wanted to move away what's the point why continue doing this I I just want to get away from it all at least have peace just me and the Lord and some mountain someplace I've thought of that I thought about how nice that would be get a little RV you know and uh, go out to the Rocky Mountains find me a spot sit down with my Bible I'd always have to have a microphone though some way of broadcasting but Just give me a simple life. I'm thrilled with that. So we come to verse 3 now. And it says, he's talking about treacherous men, and they bend their tongues like their bow for lies. But they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. And so God says, 
They don't know me. How can you tell? Because they go from one evil thing to another. It's never about God. It's never about doing what's right. It's, it's just about telling lies. It's about doing evil. That's not the mark of a person who knows the Lord. Now, they had Hebrew blood flowing through their vein, but it didn't matter, just like Christians today. So-called Christians can say that they are born again. But if they have worldly attitudes, if they spend their money the way the world does, if, if their priorities are the world's priorities, what good is it? God would say to them, they know not me. By their fruits ye will know them, Scripture says. Verse 4, Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not in any brother. For every brother, brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. You can't trust anyone if they're evil. You really think you can trust somebody to do the right thing for you if they don't care about doing the right thing for God if they don't respect their creator what makes you think they will respect you if they don't put their creator first, first what makes you think that they're going to treat you well or that you can trust them if somebody loves Jesus you can trust them. Oh, they still will make mistakes just like you and I do. But, but there's a foundation there. You know, if you really love Jesus, or if someone really loves Jesus, then they're going to do the right thing because of their relationship with Jesus. Verse 5. And they will deceive everyone his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies and wearied themselves to commit iniquity. They try hard. They work at it. It's one thing to fall into sin. Everybody falls into sin. But it's a whole different thing to premeditate and work at it, to calculate how you're going to do it. Verse 6, thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. You know, when the fear of God left the people, the foundation of their society crumbled. No one could be trusted. No one cared about anyone else. Verse 7. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will melt them and try them. For how else shall I do for the daughter of my people? What do you expect me to do? How do you expect me to treat people like this? God is saying. I've got to do what I've got to do. And God has to do what is just. Because that's how he is. Verse 8. Their tongue is as an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth but in his heart he lieth in wait can't trust him two faced see that's what I like about being around godly Christians what you see is what you get there's no phoniness there's no pretense and so that's the way it was with the Israelites. I mean, they were filled with, pre with pretensions and phoniness. And they spoke to you one way when they were with you, and they talked about you behind your back in a completely different way. <laughs> Verse 9. 
See, that's somebody who doesn't fear God. That's somebody who doesn't care about God. And it's so much easier to walk with the Lord and care about God than it is to calculate what you're going to say to somebody's face and what you're going to say when they're not around. I don't know. I just think it's so much simpler across the board in every area of life just to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. You, you don't have to be pretentious then, you know? Because you're doing what's right in the eyes of God and, and so you say what's right in the eyes of God and you speak the truth and you try to bless people but if you have to be negative then you're negative but you're being negative because God tells you to and you don't do it behind their back you do it to their face because you care about them so much easier to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness you don't have to be deceitful <laughs> you know and you don't have to worry about anything either as long as you're putting Jesus first he'll take care of you might not have everything that you want but guaranteed you'll have everything that you need for as long as he wants you to live verse 9 shall I not visit them for these things what do you expect me to do again God is saying Sh shouldn't I punish people for being like this should I not visit them for these things saith the Lord shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this and it's God's soul that is attacked when we commit sin we can when we sin it usually hurts somebody else but all sin is primarily sin against God it is his soul that is attacked every time we commit sin so you know he he makes it clear that he has to do something and God's punishment equals misery for sinners so it's not going to be good God's punishment is not pleasant for anyone including God himself but God says don't I have the right to punish these people who are doing such unspeakable things to one another and to me? And the assumed answer is, of course. Verse 10. For the mountains will I take up a weeping and wailing, and for the habitations of the wilderness a lamentation, because they are burned up so that none can pass through them neither can men hear the voice of the cattle both the fowl of the heavens and the beast have fled they are gone and I will make Jerusalem heaps and a den of dragons and I will make the cities of Judah desolate without inhabitation they lived like brute beasts, like animals, no morals. Actually, wild animals had better no morals than, than they did. So God's going to turn Jerusalem and the rest of the cities into ruins, fit for only one thing, wild animals. Verse 12. Who is the wise man that may understand this? And, and who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord hath spoken that he may declare it for why has the land perished and burned up like a wilderness that none passeth through God's asking why do you think all this bad stuff is happening don't you understand it's not a coincidence it's not fate God's in control. 13. And the Lord saith, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, neither walked therein. That's why it's happening. You're breaking the commandments. 14. But have walked after the imagination of their own heart, and after the, after the Balaam, 
which their fathers taught them. Balaam was a false prophet. People are listening to the false prophets because the false prophets were taking surveys, as it were. What do the people want to hear? What makes them happy? Oh, that's what I will say in my sermons. Let's take a survey. That's what some churches do. They take a survey. They, they pass out um, questionnaires to neighborhoods around their church, and they ask them questions. What would you like? What, what kind of sermons do you like to hear? What do you think should be talked about by the preacher in church? What other things do you want to be in a church? And then they do their church, and they preach their sermons to give those people what they want. <laughs> you say, well, that's the way it should be. Boy, are you messed up. You look at Timothy and Titus, and you find out what a preacher should do. Reprove, rebuke, rebuke, instruct, teach, correct, using the word of God, give yourself entirely to these things. You don't have church to please the people in the neighborhood. You have church to please God, and the people in the neighborhood who have a heart for God will be pleased. Those who don't will go their separate ways. Fine, let it be. But what's the point of having church if you're going to be like these false teachers? Who told the people what they wanted to hear? Made no sense. Never did. Never does. Verse 15. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood and give them water of gall to drink. Wormwood was bitter and uh, means bitter and gall. A, a drink that is described as gall is bitter too. So what should be nice, what should be sweet, what should be good is going to be bitter, says God. It's the fruit of your sin. If your life is filled with bitterness, I'm not saying it's your fault, okay? But if your life is filled with bitterness, a good thing to do would be to examine your conscience and confess any sins that come to mind because you might be contributing to it. 15. Actually, 16. I will scatter them also among the heathen whom neither they nor their fathers have known. And I will send a sword after them till I have consumed them. You're going you're gonna to be living with the heathen that you admired so much. You love their gods. You liked how they behaved, so you did it. Well, guess what? You're going to go live with them now. And something else, they're not going to be very nice to you. You're going to be devoured by the sword. So God is saying, why do you think you have so many troubles? Why is your land a wasteland? It never used to be that way. Don't you remember? You have rebelled. That's why. And you refuse to change. That's why. 17. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider ye, and call for the mourning women, that they may come, and send for skillful women, that they may come, and let them make haste, and take up a wailing for us, that our eyes may run down with tears, and our eyelids gush out with waters. For a voice of wailing is heard out of Zion. How are we despoiled? We are greatly confounded because we have forsaken the land, because our dwellings have cast us out. Now they're blaming themselves, which is right where the blame is. 20. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O ye women. And let your ear receive the word of his mouth, and teach your daughters wailing, and every one of her neighbor lamentation. For death has come up into our windows, 
and it has entered into our palaces to cut off the children from without and the young men from the streets. God calls for the professional mourners to come and weep at the funeral of their nation. 22. Speak. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, even the carcasses of men shall fall as dung upon the open field, and as the handful after the harvest man, and none shall gather them. And people are going to die, and others are just going to walk right by them and leave them rot. The dead bodies of God's people are just going to lay on the ground and rot like a crop that has been cut down but not taken off the field. Just no regard and no time to have funerals because they're going to be chased out of their land. They're going to be pursued by the enemy. Not even time for a funeral. Not even time for a decent burial. Your wife, your husband, your kids fall dead at your side and you leave them and you walk away. Now tell me again just how wonderful sin is. And, and you got people who think they're so smart, so cocky, laugh at sin, say it's old fashioned. I got news for you. Sin never goes out of style. If something was wrong a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, five thousand years ago, it's wrong today. No matter how popular it might be. 23. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Now, it's okay to have these things, but not to boast about having them and not to put your trust in them. Number one, they're a gift from God, so why would you boast about having them? As if you're better than others who don't. And number two, they're not going to last. What's the point in boasting about something like strength and might and wealth? What's the point of trusting in these things when they're not going to last and you can't count on them? Verse 24. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord who exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. In other words, boast in God. God is the only reason we are alive, and when things go well, God is the only reason they do go well. So, you want to boast in something, give all glory to God. Verse 25, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will punish all them that are circumcised with the uncircumcised, Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab and all that are in the utmost corners that dwell in the wilderness. For all these nations are uncircumcised. That means they don't know me. They don't walk with me, which is what that's symbolic of. And all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in the heart. They, they may have had it in their body, but they didn't have it in their heart. They didn't, they didn't know me. They went through the operation. And Judah, the southern kingdom, placed her trust in the religious rite of circumcision. How can you be so foolish? Do you really think that going through an operation, a physical operation, is going to make you right with God? They did. They put their trust in that instead of putting it in a relationship with God. Same thing happens today. People, sometimes some people, 
who call themselves Christians put their trust in the religious rite of baptism or holy communion and and they think that's what makes them right with God or confirmation they repeating some prayers and going through a ritual that makes me right with God no it doesn't instead of putting your trust in something like that put your trust in a relationship with God and that only happens when you repent of your sin and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life to be your Lord and your Savior and you're dead serious about it you mean business and God says with regards to his Old Testament people he says these other nations who do not deserve me and do not serve me and are not saved they go through the operation of circumcision too and you're going to be punished just like them for the same reason neither of you know me let's just slip into chapter 10 real quick chapter 10 verse 1 O oh, hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you O house of Israel thus saith the Lord learn not the way of the heathen and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven for the heathen are dismayed at them don't be superstitious don't give heed to false teachers and don't serve false gods and don't pay any attention to any of their threats verse 3 for the customs of the people are vain they're useless why, why are you enamored why do you follow after them and he describes it the customs of the people are vain this is talking about false religions look what they do <clears throat> it says for one cutteth a tree out of the forest the work of the hands of the workmen with an axe they deck it with silver and gold they fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not they are upright as the palm tree but speak not they must be born because they cannot go be not afraid of them for they cannot do evil neither also is it in them to do good and no that's not talking about a Christmas tree okay God is saying to his people get rid of your idols they can't help you if you worship them and they won't harm you if you throw them away so throw them away they're useless they're nothing I got to stop right now but if you want to study the word of God you know where you can do that right if you've been with me for any length of time you know that I'm about to tell you about the scripture verse by verse website which can be found at the Bible verse by verse dot com that's the Bible verse by verse dot com check it out click on the book you want to study click on the first click on either the first journey through the Bible or the second it would be scripture verse by verse one or scripture verse by verse 2 click on the one you want to study click on the uh, book of the Bible you want to study click on the chapter open your Bible follow along and listen it's that simple and you can go through the whole Bible with me doing that verse by verse it's not a chapter by chapter or a book by book study it's not a survey believe me it is a verse by verse study oh there are a few verses and numbers you know the list and stuff like that that I don't read I don't think you would appreciate that very much but as a general rule in general 99.9% .9 of it is a verse by verse study check it out at the bible verse by verse dot com and begin a study through the whole word of God with me do it today that's the bible verse by verse dot com and if the word of God is a blessing to you then I would ask that you would prayerfully consider blessing us back because this ministry is brought to you by your prayers and financial support and if the Lord leads you to give to this ministry you can do it at the Bible verse by verse dot com just click on the donate button at the top of the front page and give as the Lord may lead and I've got to stop thanks for spending this time with me I'll see you next time we'll be in chapter 10 of Jeremiah so long everyone